as I said, just to kind of warm you up, uh, I teach these large classes, so I'm used to, to, wearing, um, to wearing some hats. And I just consider yourself lucky. I sometimes bring in my full gator paraphernalia shorts. I bleed gator blue, all the rest. Uh, I noticed at the uh, hotel there, the Sheraton, that it seemed like almost everyone there under the age of, say, 40 looked to be some sort of athlete uh, that's come in to no doubt be pounded by, is it the Cardinal? It's not the Cardinals, it's the Cardinal. Um, and uh, it's, it's most impressive as a, as a Gator boy to see that. But uh, I, I wear these, uh, there I am as a litigator, a greedy, piggish litigator. Um, and I'm also a prognosticator about what are the courts doing or juries. So I wear my best kind of magician uh, or sorcerer's apprentice type hat, that sort of thing. Speak about jurisdiction when I get dressed up as Uncle Sam, become a judge, bring in a gavel, bring in a hammer, that sort of, that sort of thing to get the students entertained. And um, my mission, I suppose, in life is when I'm teaching undergrads, at least, and sometimes MBA students, is to convince them they probably don't want to go to law school because look what happens when you go to law school. <laughs> you become like this funny old man. Um, I, uh, my article for the symposium is on the Awuwa case. Um, I believe Awuwa was a West African immigrant uh, to the northeastern part of the United States, uh, hence the, his name on the, uh, on the case involving uh, a coverall janitorial services um, franchise. And it became one of the most controversial cases in recent times. Um, it caused a lot of people to be very, very concerned about what the heck the uh, Massachusetts uh, District Court, the federal court there in Massachusetts, was doing. There have been a number of emanations of that case since. And so it's kind of a little hard sometimes, I think, to get a handle on a WUA because so many different courts have had kind of hand on, that, on it. Different things have now happened in the past four years. Uh, despite the harsh uh, criticisms and the, and the fears that emanated. It was kind of like people were just an alarm that, that all these spiky things were emanating out of some crazy federal judge's cerebellum. Um, or conversely, they were saying, you know, they were just, they were idiots. Surely they were gestures. They really didn't mean it. <coughs> They've taken this system that's been working reasonably well and has been expanding worldwide and issued an opinion which in effect concluded that the franchisor and the franchisee really were inseparable for purposes of uh, the rights and the duties of those parties, and specifically um, what that meant was, uh, in effect, unfair treatment of the, of the franchisee, that the franchisee was a, an employee and thus entitled to all the benefits uh, of employment a lot of franchisors, and I can understand their concern, because if a Awuwa really became the template, at least the, the 2010 decision or opining of the federal district judge in a Awuwa became the template, um, it would change franchising dramatically in terms of saying that these uh, are not that uh, separable. Um, I'm going to go, kind of go a little off where the paper goes because like a lot of uh, journal papers, I think, articles tend to be a lot more specific than kind of the groundwork that we lay uh, into them. And even us long-winded professors have learned that you've got to sharpen your approach and keep your articles fairly short. So this is material that isn't really in the article itself, but I thought might be a nice kind of precursor to talk about what is franchising. Well, franchising, part of the confusion is, and I think Phil Mayo alluded to this with the Europeans, is that 
depending on who you're talking to and what their history and culture has been, the perception of franchising varies. Um, I'm going to go to Europe next month and be at a conference where the approach of the lawyers and the professors and others that deal with distribution law, which includes franchising, I think they, they take a different take. They tend to often be focused much more on the framework that we wouldn't be. They'd be thinking more of, of the producers of goods and services, the distributor type models, which can be in franchising, uh, the making of goods, that sort of thing. Whereas our focus when we talk about franchising in the United States, and certainly most of the growth, has been not so much in making. You know, Subway really isn't, they're not franchising the making of, of submarine sandwiches. They're franchising the business format for running what turns out to be an operation of selling um, you know, subs and, and other items. Uh, and franchising could be distribution, think you know, gas stations. But again, so much of the growth has been in the business format uh, area. And I think sometimes this leads to confusion. It leads to confusion, as Phil says, when people talk about uh, filings with the FTC when there are no such things. And it leads to confusion when people start thinking too much of franchising in the same vein as securities law, because it, it, they're not viewed typically as securities. You can go back to the Howey case and see why that would be, because the franchisee is supposed to be an integral member of the network engaged in his or her own blood, sweat, and tears, and so isn't viewed as that investor who kind of just pops the money in and then wishes it success. Um, so when people speak in the securities vein, they're usually off topic. And th again, that was sort of, I think, the assumption with employment and why people were so alarmed. Um, so many was they looked at the WUA case or any case like that and said, you don't even get it. You don't even understand what a franchise uh, is about. Um, people have sometimes written, uh, there's a professor uh, in the Northeast at Quinnipiniac, uh, Professor Sandy Michael John, who I know wrote an article about Article 2 of the UCC and some of the principles from that that we can learn from with franchising. But again, sales of goods, UCC principles don't usually tell us what we need uh, to know. Um, I think as one of the uh, questioners pointed out, at the heart of franchising, regardless what perspective you come from, uh, it, it is contract, and it's contract law. Um, and you're going to refer to written documents, and in those written documents, so much of the contract is going to be uh, formed. Uh, I have an article that just came out about a year ago on the parole evidence rule, and uh, my argument with regard to the parole evidence rule is that it's complex enough as it is. It's hard enough to get people to even spell it right. You know, we're not talking about paroling Charles Manson. We're talking about parole as in words. It's hard to know how the parole evidence rule works in the simplest of cases. And then when you throw in the franchising mix and the business to business angle, a lot of the things which in my simpler days in law school, and I thought, oh, fraud would always be kind of an exception to the parole evidence rule. I'll put on my fraudster hat here for a moment. Apologies somewhat to use car salesman with my plaid tie. But when we think of fraud, I used to think in simpler terms that, oh, if somebody defrauded you, you know, parole evidence rule isn't going to work. You can always argue about what was said. But uh, we know that if it's a business-to-business -business context, and if there's something actually in the writing that supports the person who says, oh, I didn't commit fraud, but at any rate, you shouldn't have relied upon what I said, and that's typically the franchisor who's being accused of that, then the business-to-business -business context, the parole evidence rule, will often keep that information from, from coming in. Uh, what the court will do is it will take the six or however many multi-eyed versions of the contract that are presented 
and say we got to chop all those eyeballs off but the one that's right in the written agreement because you were warned there in writing and you're a business person you're sophisticated enough to know what you're what you're getting into and that is I think sometimes at the heart of these disputes that that a franchisor will say at some point you know these are big boys and girls that we're dealing with these aren't consumers have another article <laughs> on the South African law that was enacted in 2008, kind of came into effect in 2010. It's called the Consumer Protection Act. But interestingly enough, unlike almost any other consumer protection law I'm aware of in the world, it actually explicitly, in effect, covers franchises. And so there's this whole industry, perhaps, of protections that may be built in. And that's probably because of the um, history of apartheid, the history of, of people coming into the business world who just a generation or two earlier probably were illiterate, let alone not running businesses. Because of that approach, it's far different from our approach, which as I said again, with the parole evidence rule and other kind of approaches in business to business context says, you know, you're, you're, you've got to start with a contract and probably end with the contract in terms of the protections uh, you may have. And uh, this, of course, is unsatisfactory to a lot of franchisors when they get into dispute, they hire lawyers, and uh, sometimes discover there's not much they can do. Since I'm in San Francisco area, I'll put on my San Fran style uh, police hat as we're talking about the policing of the, uh, the franchise relationship and the law there is. But as you see, there's really no all uh, encompassing definition, let alone framework of laws that covers franchising. Um, and in that sense, it is, a, it is a growth industry. Some people have accused it of being a growth industry for the lawyers <laughs> and not just um, for the industry. Uh, and there are all sorts of applicable regulations, there are different approaches. We haven't even dealt with codes of ethics, but there's a a burgeoning area of research where people have looked at the codes of ethics, which are found in many, many countries. A lot of the countries that don't have specific franchise laws, nonetheless, because they have franchisee associations, such as the British Franchise Association, they will have what? They will have codes of ethics. And we know, deontologists and others, we all know, that what will happen over time is if you create duties, even ethical duties, courts will sometimes have a tendency to recognize those and take things which may have simply been ethical or moral principles and say, well, they're part of the industry, they're part of the custom, they're part of the tradition, they are, in effect, part of the law. Um, we can cut through um, these. I'll just, I'll just point out, to me, what's interesting is to say disclosure is just the first issue. You know, is there a disclosure? Was it required? The next issue, which we all know from first year of contracts law, is well, what are your remedies? Um, the Federal Trade Commission rule, for instance, there is no cause of action for franchisees. There's no private cause of action. Now, indirectly, in many situations, I think you you can find a way to argue that the failure to disclose properly is some act of fraud or some other thing for which you can sue. But you can't just directly invoke um, the FTC rule. And in a lot of other countries, you discover it's somewhat similar in terms of just because there's a violation doesn't necessarily mean there is a, a remedy that you could, uh, you could implement. Um, so there are a lot of practical considerations. If we're talking about uh, in the foreign realm, um, and this, of course, is an insult to the great apes. But uh, if you're thinking about how will a franchisor best comply with the laws, you have all the cultural issues, you have all the business and marketing uh, issues, you have the long-term nature of contracts. Um, there was an article written, uh, I'm, I'm quite jealous of this because I don't think Professor Hadfield ever wrote again in franchising. But there was an article published, I believe, in the Stanford Law Review in 1990, 
And it's got to be one of the most cited articles in franchising even to this day because she wrote about relational contracts and franchising. And uh, kind of a light bulb went uh, off in a lot of people's heads, a lot of practitioners and others. And from our modern perspective, I guess we'd all go, well, duh. But at the time and ever since, people have looked at that and said, oh, yeah, it's a relational contract. It's long term. It's almost an agreement that we're going to continue to agree to work with each other, kind of like I'm sure it's going to work out between Ukraine and Russia. If they could just sit down and agree to agree, everything will work out. Um, there are those difficulties just of time, no matter how good the position of the parties is initially over the course of a 10, a 15, a 20 year relationship. Um, negotiated changes can be difficult. Uh, renewals can be problematic. Um, one person is more focused on costs, another person is more focused on risks uh, separate and apart from, from costs. Um, I think Bill adequately dealt certainly with the FTC rule. Um, a lot of the writing in franchise law research uh, is still dealing with definitions. I tell people, um, and this may just be a person, one person telling you his small uh, consulting that he's done over the years. Um, and I'm not an active practicing lawyer in franchise law, but occasionally I get called for consulting because people see my name pop up a lot on franchise law research. There, there usually are two things I'm called about. Um, it's not about 80% or 90% of the things I've written over the years. It's two things. One is vicarious liability. They want me to look at franchise contracts and give some sort of input as to whether there was so much control that in fact the franchisor can be held accountable for actual control. Sometimes they'll have me look at the apparent authority issues, uh, which also arise obviously in vicarious liability, that was there the misperception in the community at large and specifically let's say in the consumer that the franchisor and franchisee were inseparable. You know, these people didn't realize that McDonald's out of Oak Brook, Illinois, doesn't really own all those golden arches. But the other issue I get, still occasionally asked, is the most basic question of all, which is, is it a franchise? You know, could you look at this state statute? Could you look at this regulation? Um, and could you tell us, based on you know what this is doing, uh, what the contract is, what the arrangement is, would it fall under the uh, the franchise law uh, parameters. Um, some other countries, I think, will tend to focus, and maybe it's cultural as much as anything else. What I found interesting, at least with, with France, is they're very oriented towards signs. And uh, maybe it goes back to the, to the medieval tradition of even if people were illiterate, well, you could still put up a sign. You just have a picture of something. And whatever that picture is, um, is what is being produced. Um, and so the signage is very, very uh, important. Now that ties in with what we would call in the modern context trademarks, but you will still see laws and uh, rulings which are talking more about signs and they don't necessarily make as much sense in the internet age and that again creates more opportunity for work for lawyers and potential for dispute because one person is thinking along sort of the internet, um, almost post-computer, post, -computer, post um, anything other than the virtual reality we live in world and the other person is thinking of signs and, and other things and even sort of a pre-trademark trademark, um, era. Uh, so another area that I've written on and other people have certainly dealt with is, is know-how. Um, and I've discovered, I'd be interested in Phil's take on this at some point, that in some countries I think they're more oriented towards know-how than we are in the United States. In the United States I think we're much more oriented, we're oriented toward know-how in the business context. You know, what are you actually getting, you know? Uh, why would you buy a franchise if you could do it all yourself? And, and thus avoid what? Paying the 5%, 4%, whatever it is, royalties, plus that initial fee, plus the controls of the franchisor, et cetera. Why would you do that if you're not really being given know-how? So from a business context, there's, there are these protections. Uh, 
that should be there in the contract elsewhere. There should be the uh, due diligence of the franchisee and his agents, you know, accountants, lawyers, et cetera, to make sure this person's really getting what he's getting. But the law doesn't seem to necessarily step in that much. But if you go to places, again, in France and elsewhere in Europe, I think their tradition is much more likely to be to look at savoir-faire, to look at know-how and say, are you really getting this con continuing stream of uh, protections? Um, then, as I said before, we can look at codes of ethics. We can look at um, what other associations have done. The European Federation of Franchising simply sort of took whole cloth what the French Federation had put forth. And they have a whole series of uh, statements, which to my mind are not far afield really from what you would expect in actual laws, things that, that members of the association are expected to have in their contracts uh, and that sort of thing. So if they don't do that, then they're obviously not members in good standing. Um, and so uh, there are these problems or disputes uh, in the franchising uh, world. Um, and as Phil pointed out, you can buy all sorts of, read all sorts of books on the, on the history of franchising. Uh, I read something interestingly the other day, which was trying to argue that maybe the first franchises actually were things like coffee houses in Japan going back to the 1600s. So who knows? And in effect, really sort of who cares because things have changed so differently. But you can also find a lot of books which are probably a lot more important because these are the books probably a lot of people who are thinking of franchising buy or at least borrow or maybe find an online digital version of. And those are the books on, so you want to franchise, you know, franchising for idiots, that sort of thing. And they go through the litany of advantages and disadvantages to uh, franchising. And um, if you don't see a lot of disadvantages listed, you know, that's the type of book you want to run away from. It's, it's because there are a lot of disadvantages. Um, and, and even groups which are sometimes pilloried, I think, unfairly as being tools of the franchisor, you know, the International Franchise Association, something like that. Find people there, and if you go on their website, you'll see a warning, in effect, if you kind of go around, which kind of tells people franchising isn't really for someone who wants to be really quite entrepreneurial in nature. If, you're, if your nature is entrepreneurial, if you're used to running your own business, if you're to use Phil's example with Mary Beth, and you run that business and now they're buying you out, you better be you know, okay with the notion that you really won't be uh, independent in effect anymore. There are gonna be a lot of constraints on your behavior now. You're going to have to give something of your independence up in return for the hand-holding features, the trademark, and some of the protections that you hope you get from the franchise or And of course, the franchisor, as Phil elaborated, has some of the same, should have some of the same concerns in terms of um, with the franchisee, on the other hand, you don't get the same thing you do with the control over uh, manager Brian or, or others. Um, <laughs> Part of what gets the whole franchising framework puts it in some measure of difficulty in the uh, realm of the third party is the trademark. Uh, because we have all sorts of uh, research out there um, that deals with um, the cognitive biases and the other um, problems associated with thinking about everything around us. <laughs> you know, we misperceive. Part of that may go from that book that says, you know, I learned everything I needed to learn in kindergarten. Well, that's all well and good, but there's research out there that also tells us that our, our logic, our stream of thoughts, how we deduce things, doesn't really change much from when we were five or six. You know, that's why we probably all need science education and then we need to have it beaten into us again and again and again because maybe our minds, going back to caveman times, just don't think that way naturally. Uh, we need to kind of counter it. And in the business realm, that seems to really be the case. 
Um, you can tell people until you're blue in the face that you know the franchisee is legally, in most instances, going to be considered independent of the franchisor. And thus, if the franchisee does something in his business that harms you, you know, you slip on a wet floor there at your local but franchised establishment, yeah, you may have a good case against that franchisee, the owner of that individual business, but you have no case uh, in most instances against the franchisor. And uh, I defy you to find people, relatively well-educated people, but non-lawyers, who tend to go along with that and say, yes, I know that, and I agree with it. It's hard to find them to, to take both those positions. Some of them will know it, but a lot of them will have real problems, even if they know it, with agreeing with it. They will look at the trademark, for instance, and they'll say, well, how's that fair? You know, their gut reaction is, you know, McDonald's and the franchisees are inseparable. Um, there's no way they could exist without each other. And so we ought to be able to go after anyone sort of associated with that business when we are harmed at that business or by one of the businesses licensed there. And I think the trademark um, is often at the heart of this, you know? Ironically, the more recognized it is and understood by the, franchi by the, by the consuming public, the more the franchisor has to almost kind of pull back and say, even though the Lanham Act says, you know, you have to control enough so that you don't lose your, your mark, they have to pull back and, and show to the public that these people are truly independent and maybe they even have to get much more explicit and say, and that means, even though we stand behind the service and product, that doesn't mean in a court of law we will stand behind what the franchisee has, has done. Um, and of course, it deals with good law, goodwill, et cetera. Um, some of you maybe have felt like, I know Ronald McDonald got a makeover recently. I don't know if you read that, but he slimmed down a little bit. They gave him a spiffy, a spiffy little vest. It reminds me of the vest that you're required to wear in Austria. Uh, how many of you have been to Austria? I didn't know this. Last summer, I went in, I kid you not, I went and I got my little decal in Austria because you're required in places like Switzerland and Austria to buy that decal. Uh, if you don't buy it, it may be just 10 euros. If you're there for an extended stay, it might be as much as 50 euros. But if you don't buy it and you're stopped, big whoop and fine. So I went in, I buy my 10, bought my 10 decal, uh, euro decal, and the guy there at the store at the Austrian border said, and uh, do you have your vest? You know, and I'm from Florida. I said, well, you know, I know it's a little colder here in Austria, but it is August. I don't think I need my vest. Uh, and he said, no, you need your vest. And it turned out in Austria, you need a vest if you're on. I, don't, I didn't see anybody in Vienna wearing them. But if you're on the open road, if you're stopped, you've got to have that vest. And you have to have a vest for everyone in the car. I had to make a second purchase because I talked to enough people and discovered that my wife who was accompanying me, I would still be a reprobate maid, or she would, if we only had one vest between us. So I looked at Ronald McDonald. I immediately thought of Austria. I immediately thought of that big, happy, yellow or orange vest. Maybe we think of Ronald and want to take him away. But the irony to me is, this is much creepier. The Burger King guy, I mean, he's just creepy. Um, Burger King, maybe it all stems from that particular uh, mascot, but Burger King's been much more ensnared in a lot of these lawsuits and encroachment cases, which I guess have died. Would you say they've died down a little bit, Bill? I think they have died down. We, we wrote so much about it, the professors and the lawyers, that finally, I guess, uh, and the contracts basically changed to deal with encroachment. But if you were looking up encroachment, you, you started with Burger King. And there's just a slew of cases. And uh, God loves Florida, or God must love Florida, because so many of these cases uh, dealt with Florida law and went through Florida courts because Burger King, um, you know, is tended to be headquartered in Miami, and that's where the, the cases had to be brought. Um, inequality and bargaining power. You know, the big sumo guy versus little cute sumo guy. Um, and I, I put that purposely there, I'll have you know. That was not a mistake on my part. It started typing that way, and I thought, oh, how felicitous. I will keep it that way. 
the Awua case and fees kind of ended up kind of going backwards or the flip side. I would argue that if you look at the Awua case, part of what happened there is the fees do seem to be disproportionate or higher than, say, the norm in the industry. You can look at some very big companies, and uh, people will perhaps assume you know, you're buying a McDonald's, you're buying a hotel, your uh, franchise, some other really fairly large, well-established, very costly franchise. The fees must be really high, but they really aren't in terms of the, the total upfront outlay. And part of that may stem from, as I'll mention if I have time, the, the tax laws, which tend to treat fees in a way which, in my very simplistic fashion as a non-tax lawyer, I look at it and say, well, there's no real incentive to have really high fees in terms of who's paying taxes and who's able to take some sort of um, deduction or spreading over time, that sort of thing. But I think a lot of it, too, is um, someone who's pointing out, well, the good franchisors, the ethical ones do things a certain way. The others may do things a little different way. Uh, I think a sign for a good franchisor often is they're not charging very high fees. Their expectation is they're going to make money over the long haul through the royalty, through the stream of profits, through the hopeful growth in the, in the business together. And so that might have been a giveaway. Um, but part of the problem in Awuwa is the people in those cases that purchased these janitorial franchises probably weren't even thinking too much about what was in the contract, let alone some of the deeper issues in terms of the fees versus um, other, other fields. Um, Massachusetts, incidentally, doesn't have um, you know, a, relationship, a relationship law. Um, and so maybe that's another reason that Awuwa ended up the way it did is the focus really had to be more on not so much franchise laws, but on just the very basic um, kind of going back to the common law question of is this an independent contractor or not, or is it in fact an employee or a servant? Um, the reason that that approach may have taken place is that you, you, you couldn't really necessarily, depending on the state you're in, you couldn't depend on a good cause statute um, and duties of good faith. One of the things that franchisees run into is if the franchise contract is explicit on a point, unless it's some unconscionable phrasing, which is highly doubtful, then you know, it's going to be very, very difficult for a franchisee to challenge anything that's in that contract as being um, in violation of the duty of good faith. The duty of good faith is a, is a niche filler. It isn't supposed to replace phrases or, or standards in the actual written um, agreement. So um, we can cut through a little bit of that. Um, I mean, other arguments have been tried. Uh, equitable estoppel is sometimes um, asserted. Uh, I think, again, the problem you run into is usually if you've gotten into a writing and if you certainly reach the contracting stage, then it's a little bit harder to go to principles which arise and, and usually work much better when you don't have a writing. When maybe there was conversations, there were negotiations, but you didn't actually end up with um, uh, a franchise. <laughs> Um, surprisingly to my mind, and the professors may disagree with me on this, I don't see as much writing out there on the sophisticated versus the unsophisticated um, parties as you might think there would be. Because at least to my mind, when I look at a lot of these cases, and I've made that argument in my parole evidence rule uh, article, and I think I've made it in one or two others, uh, a dividing line that maybe would give a little more comfort to people from the franchisor end of the spectrum is to say, okay, we're going to really try to delineate whether people are sophisticated or not. And if someone's a sophisticated business person, yeah, you know, why should we give these protections 
to him. Why should we treat him like a baby, like a little sumo wrestler in a diaper? But for some of those, like Mr. Oluwa, who truly are unsophisticated, who probably wouldn't be as sophisticated as, as the average sort of manager or supervisor, um, you know, certainly not a business person or an owner, but just a supervisor or something at a, at a business, um, to divide that, and then maybe franchisors would be a little more receptive to the approach taken. Yes? I think a better analysis than sophisticated and unsophisticated might be the concept of information imbalance. You start with that concept, mm -hmm. there's always going to be an information imbalance between franchisor yeah. that's operated many, many, many businesses, no matter how much buyer is a lawyer, buyer is a doctor, buyer might go to Stanford or Harvard. Yeah. So that, I, I think you want to put that yeah. in well, and I, and I certainly do that, and I know others have done that as well, but it fits into that mix, and whether you start with sophistication and end up with the imbalance, or you start with the imbalance and then say, now how could that be remedied? Um, and I, I, to my mind, franchisees, if they truly are sophisticated, if you're, say, a doctor who presumably is sophisticated in many other areas, but not necessarily in running a business, we could perhaps make certain assumptions that they should at least be hiring people, looking to get people involved. And it's going to be difficult, I think, to get courts and regulators and others to accept the notion that um, everything sort of has to be handed to. But on the other hand, um, I understand what you're saying, and there's certainly a lot of research out there that indicates people are not necessarily too good at picking up what they don't know. Um, I, I have a little bit of that in the paper. I don't quote Donald Rumsfeld, but as much as I didn't necessarily care too much for Donald Rumsfeld as Secretary of Defense, <coughs> um, I do love that marvelous exchange he had where he says, we don't know what we need to know that we don't know that we need to know in order to know what we, you know, you could just go on and on and on, an eternal loop. But it's, but it's actually, it's, it's correct in the sense that you know, the most important thing with, or, or the biggest problem with ignorance isn't so much if you're ignorant, it's if you're ignorant of your own ignorance. Um, and so if the doctor knows or should know enough, the otherwise sophisticated person knows or should know enough that he needs more information and can get the information, then I don't think we need to worry as much. But if he's in a position that regardless of his fine medical education and other knowledge in other areas, there's just no way he's going to pick up on this, and he can be easily kind of led into a situation just like anybody else who's relatively unsophisticated. Then I think your information balance phrasing may be the better way to, to do it. I think it is a, it, it is a mixture. Um, and, and the danger I could see for a franchisee litigator, I suppose, is I would probably not like the word sophistication as much without a lot of clarifying terms. And then you run into that problem of, of judges and juries who aren't as sympathetic to someone who is well-educated, well-heeled, fairly well-off, who's willing to invest a fair amount of money, um, they're going to tend to say, you know, so what about your information and balance? Yes? Was it part of the problem with the statutes that we try to use how much money you have to proxy for how sophisticated you are? Yes. Which, I mean, I've never been able to figure out why it would be. I would, I would argue that, that a, better, a better approach to take would be often time in the business, you know. If you could, if you could get someone who's owned, um, and so I propose things like either they've owned in that particular business, or managed, you know, for a for a, for a extended period of time in that particular business, or if it's franchising generally, even if it's a totally different franchise, they've been a franchisee uh, in the past, that sort of thing, because that experience will, I think, often outweigh. Um, you know, anything else in terms of knowing sort of the questions to ask, what to look for, who to seek out for that, for that information. We also have what's called information uh, overload. Um, and uh, I haven't done this, but I promised myself I'm going to try to do this in the future. I'm going to not be so willy-nilly willing to recommend disclosures, you know, give more information. Okay, we won't require the franchisor to do X but we will require him or her, it, 
to tell the franchisee about X and then leave it up to the franchisee. We know from information overload that, that people just don't read enough, they don't understand enough, they push it to the side. Um, and uh, I know the FTC and others, I think, are starting to deal with that, starting to recognize that as, a, as, an, as an issue. So that isn't always a satisfactory approach to, I think, to sophistication or the, or the lack the lack thereof. Um, there I am is uh, Russell Crowe, if any of you were, were interested. The lawyer as the, uh, as the gladiator, the advocate for the, uh, for the client. And there I am in my French bib. My, uh, otherwise known as a, a coutume, a costume for being a, uh, an academic over in, in France. Everybody in Europe, it seems like all the, all the professors have their own garb and professorial costumes and all that, that they don't necessarily dress up as a used car salesman. Uh, if you do actually read my uh, article when it comes out, hopefully in the next few months, what you'll discover is, uh, and this isn't the first time uh, I propose this, uh, Yuri, one of the other speakers, and I, in, a, in an article we co-authored, talked about franchisee associations, and I wrote about them 20 plus years ago in the Vanderbilt Law Review. Uh, one of my arguments is, okay, maybe with, um, with group action and possible collective bargaining franchisees, a lot of the difficulties that individual franchisees might experience could be uh, alleviated. And so that's kind of my image there of uh, the, the big fish franchisor, um, I guess uh, up at the top without a franchisee association, and these are both exaggerations, obviously. I don't think you're, you're really talking about uh, something in terms of something as stark as one side eating the other side. But it does sometimes, I think, create a much, a much clearer, cleaner, safer environment for franchising to have um, as associations. Now, <laughs> sorry, that isn't all, folks. I'll just get a little bit more specifically into um, the, uh, the paper and point out what actually happened. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to, to intervene, ask a question. The court found that a training program and that licensing, that coverall, which is a janitorial service franchise, had uh, with respect to Mr. Awu and others was not separately distinct from what the franchisees were actually doing, which was, of course, you know, cleaning buildings, etc., for various uh, customers or what they were called clients. Uh, and in fact, what the court said is you can't really separate it. I think they discounted the amount of training and licensing assistance and other services associated with getting a business running and going and looked at it and said, you really aren't that distinct from what the franchisee is doing at the ground level. And if you can't find such a distinction, uh, and we can't, then we're not going to treat you as a separate uh, independent contractor. We're going to treat you like an employee. And so as I said at the outset, this created a hullabaloo. Uh, people were just, you know, somehow that sounds more like a southern phrase. They probably didn't say that in Massachusetts. But they said something about it. They were upset. And what's interesting to me is I don't think, and Phil, you might correct me on this, but I don't think we've seen a lot of cases since Oluwa that you would say, ah, it's leading down the primrose path. And I think the reason for that is Awuwa may have just been an outlier in terms of the degree to which, um, as the, the franchise, uh, as the judge found, there were these um, problems in terms of who was being selected as franchisees and what they were actually doing and how independent they really were. Um, and there was that. And then there was, um, there was also the... Uh, I, I suppose part of it really was just the, 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 the phenomenon of the type of people who were actually in the field. I mean, you're talking about typically so many of them were immigrants, so many of them, their English skills were, were, um, were pretty bad. 
Uh, so they were really at the spectrum where in a lot of instances, I think a franchisor probably on the facts shouldn't have to worry um, as, as much about it. Um, I like the second reason I think it maybe wasn't as problematic as people immediately thought is ironically the very thing that caused alarm was the salvation, I think, for a lot of franchisors, and that was they were alarmed by a federal district court judge referring to the franchise arrangement as being something that in his mind couldn't be really separated from a Ponzi scheme. And you may say that and get applause from certain people, and you know, it's like we know from primary season in 2012, if you're speaking to a particular group, it may really be great, but for wider consumption, it's not so good. I think that probably undermined, in effect, um, the legitimacy, maybe, of some of the, uh, of, of the assumptions and then the opinions that flowed from it uh, of, that, of that federal judge. Um, and, and that's really what kind of undermined maybe uh, a lot of other courts adopting it. Now, I'm still in the process of trying to finalize uh, my data as to what other courts have cited AWUA in what regard, how it's been um, used. But my impression is, if it's had an effect, it's more in the, to put it in Latin, the interorum effect of terrorizing franchisors and others at the ground level. But if it actually got to an actual trial, to an actual dispute in front of the judge, I think it's, it's hard to see too many cases following the path of a Wilwa. It's more the worry that at least it's out there and we have to take more measures just to make sure it doesn't create a problem. It's a little bit like the encroachment issues maybe from, from 10, 15 years ago where franchisors had to take action in their contracts to deal with the issue. And once they got their contracts better phrased, then they started to get a little more comfort that they wouldn't have to worry about what we were finding. Yes? Yeah, I, I also just wanted to ask you, don't you think that uh, the contracts and the janitorial um, franchising, they're, they're not really typical of most franchise contracts and the degree to which the franchisor is responsible for helping that business yeah. because they actually buy the accounts if the franchisor goes out and gets to them. Yeah. It's not that, that doesn't Oh yeah, no, it's um, and, and and I know you will regret this, but that's a perfect lead-in for my uh, for my uh, a couple of my remaining little hats. Um, I hear that Maleficent, starring the beautiful and incredibly lipped Angelina Jolie, will be out in movie theaters soon. Um, I sometimes put on my Maleficent outfit and talk about how in that great Sleeping Beauty uh, cartoon, the, ba the basic takeaway I have is that there are some things you can't agent away. And so in the end, Maleficent has to basically no longer depend on the gargoyles and the crows, and she has to make herself into a giant dragon. In Awuwa, what we see are people who, I think the problem is, yes, it's what's in the agreement, and it's what these people are doing, and you're looking at what they're doing, the quote franchisees, and you're saying, are they really just kind of glorified janitors in the sense that they really can't constitute franchisees any more than if you go to a, to a, a fine hotel and you talk to the bellman, uh, the doorkeeper, that sort of person. Um, the giveaway is probably the silly hat they're wearing, but it's also, as they say, if they have a sign and it says the person's first name, and that's all it says on the, on, the, on the name plate, these are not in positions where we normally would expect franchising. Um, and so I think the franchisor may have to go even farther in terms of ensuring that these people are not um, you know, treated as glorified em employees, whether they're soda jerks or or doormen or bellhops um, or others, and maybe there was a predisposition of some people to look at it, and definitely getting the clients for them. It reminded me a little bit of the, of the, the cases out of New York City involving taxicab drivers who essentially 
Um, you know, they had certain routes, they had certain things they were doing, they worked at certain times, they owned only one taxi cab, and yet they were supposedly, you know, independent contractors from the other uh, taxi cab drivers, all showing the same, you know, yellow cab sign or whatever it was. Um, I think you got to go kind of the extra step, and they didn't do that. So on the facts, um, that's kind of an argument that's been made by a lot of people. Don't take a little bit too far. Yes? Uh, so in financial services, the mantra is typically, especially on the regular side, would be best representation. Is there any reason to float, or would you say a conscientious franchise or would it be more education than the early education system? Well, and I mean, my gosh, the, the the, the FTC disclosures, if people really, if they're being followed through on, and they, and they typically should be, I mean, it's, it's, it may be an onerous burden, but it's been out there for a long time, so franchisors, the establishments know what they're doing and have people who are pretty good at making those disclosures. If they actually were read and people did their due diligence, um, I, I, I don't think there'd be nearly the problems. The problem is that a lot of people, uh, Maybe it is information overload. Maybe it is they reach that point that they've gone through. They're, they're looking at numbers. They're trying to figure out you know, location. They're trying to figure out what exactly would I do? Can my family live with this change of events where I'm going from a middle level manager or whatever it is I am <coughs> to now being a quote independent business person? And by the time they get to the, the really the legal issues, they sometimes, I think, um, Kind of have a point of exhaustion, maybe, and they don't they don't do enough. Um, I have a paper coming out in uh, September in the San Diego Law Review, which uh, deals with franchise counsel and how often do people hire franchise counsel who are franchisees. And um, as you can imagine, the mantra from from a lot of franchisor groups, I think, over time has been that, oh, these people tend to be very well represented. There's a guy named Bill Killian who wrote an article in the Franchise Law Journal, um, ABA Journal, which has been cited time and time again, talking about the myth of you know, the, the franchisee who's, in effect, unsophisticated and incapable. Um, and I think he makes some good points, but I think sometimes that, that counter to it is, is too harsh on the other end, that these people are sophisticated, there isn't a problem with information, because there's a lot of data out there, including a little bit in my article, which shows a lot of people just don't hire counsel. Or when they bring in counsel, they bring in people at the last minute after it's sort of a fait accompli, or they actually believe when they're told there's no room for negotiation, which may be true, but may not be true, and it may, may really be you know, uh, in the great words of, you know, it depends on what is is, it depends on what negotiations are. You have all those issues taking place. So, yeah, I think if, if there were a way of getting this information across and, and getting people to understand how important it is to not lose sight of the need for probably to spend a little bit more and get that legal counsel involved, probably spend a little bit more in terms of the accounting and other things that in the long term, they're going to be a lot a lot happier with what they get into, or maybe they'll avoid um, a, a problem. Um, and, and the other thing with franchisors is, and Phil I know could speak better to this from his um, angle as a practitioner, is if they're pretty successful, um, they often have so many more applicants for franchises than you know, they can actually you know, build or provide that it's in their own interest to carry out these disclosures, to carry out sort of the information campaign, and not take someone who's going to be a problem because they're not really getting it. You know, get get the persons who do have a little bit more experience, do understand things a little bit, a little bit more. Um, you know, they may be a little bit sharper in terms of their negotiating with you and other things, but, but if you don't see a pattern of recklessness or litigiousness on their part, if I were advising a franchisor, I would say go with those people because even though you may not get quite everything you would with someone who's less sophisticated in the long run, the relationship's likely to be happy and successful and all the rest. Yeah. Um, 
what I get out of the Aruha case is control by the janitorial franchisor. And um, I believe there's a case involving 7 Eleven. Mm -hmm. um, and for just for theory purposes, if you walk down to the Safeway, which is not a franchise retail establishment, and you look at the people in there, you have employees that are stocking the shelves, collecting the money, the money goes to Safeway, it's clearly employment. But if you look at what goes on in the 7-Eleven franchise and the amount of control over the products, who owns it, where the money goes, and you look at that, there's, there's a lot of degree of similarity. And the problem in franchising is the command and control. And there's a wonderful article by a guy by the name of Andy Selvin. Mm -hmm. And he compares collaborative franchising versus command and he calls the command and control the North Korean model, which I've always loved. But, but um, w when you look at these franchise agreements and the amount of control, operations manuals, you must comply or you'll be terminated, and we can change it whenever we want. Um, so I, I, I would argue we're going to see more of these, and they seem extraordinarily radical and frightening. But when you look at what's stuffed in these agreements and what controls are there, maybe they aren't so radical. Yeah. Well, and, and again, part of the interesting thing to me, and maybe it's because I'm always kind of looking for middle ground, is um, that in a lot of instances, some of those contracts, maybe the franchisor may feel that it's necessary to have this command and control. But a lot of instances, uh, I bet what you would find is uh, for the vast bulk of the, the businesses which are working reasonably well, people aren't going to get down into the nitty gritty of are you following to the nth degree every little aspect of the command and control. If, if the royalties are flowing, if there aren't complaints coming from customers, et cetera, et cetera. And the terrorizing effect, of course, for the franchisee is if anything can be invoked, are they going to be able to point to good faith or good cause protections or other things to protect them, or are they going to be undermined by, you know, basic contract rule principles of what's there in the contract, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, the franchisor may have to make that choice of how much do you really need to, to, to do? Um, are you going to actually invoke these? And then the downside to it, and I don't know if, if uh, Andy dealt with that, is with every upside, there's a downside. And the downside is the more command and control you have, the more uh, you certainly are holding yourself open for third party uh, cases in terms of just you know all these controls. You can't have it both ways. You'll, you may try to have it both ways, but you, but you can't. Um, and so that may be the flip side, is if enough third parties, the third parties may indirectly do a service for the franchisees in those situations by bringing suits and after a while somebody's going to cry out at corporate headquarters that you know we, we can't have it both ways we're going to have to do things um a, a little bit uh a little bit differently um in terms of and i get into a little bit of this in the in the in the paper um i talk about how in effect um, all sorts of information has been provided in the legal literature, the business literature, et cetera, et cetera, as to what good franchisors should be doing to avoid the, the shadow of the LUA in terms of, you know, a little bit more hands-off in some of the controls or continued practices, which I think you will find in a fair number of franchise uh, situations where they're not bringing in people at such a low level. It may also be an argument for um, much more education. I don't know, maybe for the janitorial services, it just wouldn't be cost effective uh, to have the equivalent of Hamburger University or something for two or three weeks. But, you know, if you're really that worried that you're going to have to have that much command and control, maybe the answer is don't have so much, but really make people go through some elaborate training processes. They do this in a lot of organizations. My son works for one of the airlines. And uh, that's what you get when you're a history major. 
and then you look for a job as a social studies teacher, even with a master's. Uh, but he's working for one of the uh, one of the airlines, and he's moving up. Um, and I'm just impressed, even when he was part time, although working 30 or 40 hours, but he was still technically part time. They had him going to all sorts of training, you know. And here's somebody who, at the time, wasn't making that much more than minimum wage, but they were training him a lot, um, and they were finding it apparently cost effective. You know, to be putting him up in hotels, flying in places, well, not that much cost for US Air if you're flying someone with US Air planes. But if they can do that there, why couldn't they do that more in, um, in the franchise context sometimes and alleviate some of these, uh, some of these problems? Um, what, I, what I get to, and I'll cut some of my little yellow tabs off here, is um, I have a fair amount in the paper, and I sponge a little bit off of, of uh, what uh, Yuri and I uh, wrote in the Albany Law Review, and other people have certainly written about this in the franchising or other con uh, context, is this whole thing of cognitive bias. That people are just not making good decisions, and they don't even know. The worst thing of all is they don't even know that their decisions are just not that good until you know, months or years later when they're called on it in terms of um, some sort of dispute. Um, sometimes there's what, um, I love the, uh, the way that psychologists sometimes call this, they call it selective perception, which what they really mean is you're just biased toward the rosy, or what we might call the rose-tinted glasses scenario. I see this, I don't know if you've seen this ad, every once in a while I see it on late night TV, where they show this guy, he's like there on his couch, probably eating his Doritos, and you see something pop up on the screen, and the ad says, that was my idea. And what was the idea? The idea was something like the clapper or something. And I'm looking at that primitive knowledge of IP that I have going, what the hell are they talking about? If all your idea was, there ought to be something where if you clap, lights come on or lights come off. And if that's all you need for a patent, my god, I could have started having patents when I was four years old. And I probably have thousands of patents by now. There is this selective perception of what works. And that almost certainly feeds into some people who buy into franchising. To go back to what Norm asked, I do think people, they, they hear these stories. Um, whether it's in the franchisor angle of, uh, you know, a, a, a Roy Kroc or somebody like that, or from the franchisee perspective, somebody who bought early on into a system that succeeded. And they assume that, you know, that's representative. They don't really think through sort of the likelihood. They uh, observe something that happened recent in time, and even though it may be an outlier, that recent in time event, you know, removes all of the other things which should cause them some caution. Just kind of takes that uh, from their from their brain. Um, and what's really troubling is, uh, I think it's the Dunning Kruger. These are psychologists who've written about this. They talk about um, the double handicap, if you will, of people. And it's kind of like what Rumsfeld was talking about people who are most likely to not get help are the ones who are most likely to need the help. And why is that? Because they're the ones who are least likely to realize they don't know that much, that they need a lawyer, that they need an accountant, that they need that person. Ironically, the person who might get by, maybe that, that doctor who doesn't have any education in this area, but is otherwise a reasonably bright fellow, he may come to the conclusion that he needs a lawyer. And even if he didn't have a lawyer, he might be able to muddle through. But the person who has overwhelming self-confidence with little cause to have that <laughs> is more likely than maybe the doctor to go, you know, I'm not going to shell out 10, 15,000, 20,000 for a lawyer, whatever it might be. I'm not going to even ask around. I'm just going to go full speed ahead. And those are the people that probably need even more of that that advice. Um, one of my proposals is to just is is again to make it even more clear that you have to get a sign off 
and you have to almost expressly warn of some of the things that people might miss out on. It's almost like those ads against cigarettes or whatever where show the person with the stoma, show the person who's clearly dying at the age of 40, and maybe you know that will get through in a way if you, if you show the actual horror stories in a way than simply saying, you know, mammy pamby, having that lawyer may help, may help. But that's, again, assuming people read and pay attention. I closed the article with a little bit of discussion on tax law, which um, I kept simple because I don't really know that much tax law. Um, and it would, it would bore me and no doubt the readers if I got too complex. Um, I, what I found interesting as I was going through the tax law is I, I found it kind of interesting that presumably this is the way it works, not just in franchising, franchising generally, but in lots of licensing or networked operations in terms of payments from one party to the other and how the tax law is treated. And as I said, I, I, from what I could perceive, there were certainly incentives there that for a, a properly operating business, they would not necessarily want to have high fees or, or other such um, items. And as I said, I close with an argument that we need franchisee associations, at least available, and collective bargaining rights, at least um, a, a possibility. It's kind of a counterweight and also as a way to give some protections maybe to the, the individual franchisees who don't know enough or aren't going to think to get help until it's a little late. But franchisee associations may even, 7-Eleven was mentioned as an example. I know years ago, 7-Eleven's franchisee associations worked hand in, uh, in glove with, with the franchisors to try and craft a kind of a, a, a contract that would operate in the future. Presumably, that would give greater protections than all the advice and all the disclosures um, out there. Um, and I don't know if any of you have thought along these veins. I'll close with this. The, the fast food element, um, if you've been reading, you know that a lot of the fast food workers, particularly in large cities, have been campaigning for a raise, obviously, in minimum wage. But another thing they've really been uh, campaigning for is, uh, is worker rights, in effect, uh, and, and trying to unionize and that sort of thing, which is interesting because historically they've They've not been unionized uh, workers at that element, at that area. Um, I find it always interesting in the collective bargaining area because when you argue collective bargaining for franchisees, you're often arguing to people whose predisposition, probably personally and politically, has never been in favor of unions, <laughs> has never been in favor of sort of collectivization. They always are people that have wanted to own their own business or at least have a certain measure of independence. So working with others and doing yourself is dependent on an organization to help you, maybe counter to their nature. Um, I, I, I probably don't have the time to do this before this article ends up in, in print. And I know Michelle and Min probably don't, don't, don't want me to put any more work on it, but it just kind of occurred to me. I would love to sort of see what goes on with, say, franchisees of fast food networks who, on the one hand, um, are arguing so much against unionization by the people working for them, but on the other hand, are any of them pushing for you know, greater representation and rights um, on the other end? I think it's, it's um, I don't want to be too harsh about it, but to my mind, I could see the people at either end, the workers below them, or the franchisor back you know, in Oak Brook, Illinois, or wherever, kind of finding either what they're doing laughable, or insolent, or degrading, or something, that, that the perception that they're arguing out of both sides of, of their mouth, you know, against unionization in one hand, on the other hand, the rights that they, that they, uh, they need. And, and advisory councils, and again, Phil or other practitioners may point to exceptions to this. Most of the literature out there, when you read it, seems to be um, <coughs> advisory council, to my mind, seems to almost have a bad, a bad name to it. And maybe that's unfair, um, but you know, there are enough instances where people have talked about advisory councils and how they are used to sort of stopgap or half measures. <coughs> 
to keep franchisees from forming uh, a true bargaining uh, agent out there, or agency for them. I, I think that may be unfair. I served in student government for many happy years in middle school, high school, and college. And generally, I think we did a pretty good job. But the biggest criticism was that, in effect, we were kind of like company unions or criticism that we were alike. I didn't know what franchisee advisory councils were you know, 35, 40 years ago, but we were like those institutions. That may be unfair. It may be as much the name as anything else. But usually when you read the literature, if they say associations, you're thinking independent. When they say advisory council, you're thinking of something that probably doesn't have collective bargaining rights. And I think that undermines, other than maybe information disclosures, the real utility of those organizations in terms of making a more equitable uh, arrangement. Are there any other questions? Okay, thank you very, very much. I've, I've left one hat for the panel.